sun just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we'll never more wander but walk the streets that are pure as coal. Don't think me poor or deserted or Discouraged. I'm getting down. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a robe and a crown. I got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land. Someday yonder, we'll never more wander, but walk the streets that are pure as gold. You may be seated. It's good to see everybody here this evening. We had a good attendance at Springvale. I forgot to take a count today. But we had a good attendance. There's uh, Peggy Hill's caretaker has wanted to start a Bible study with me. So pray for her. She was busy this last week. She told me last Sunday that she wanted to study because the lessons that I've been given are creating questions in her mind. Uh, and so she told me again today that she was writing down questions as I was talking. And so she wants to get together and I've given her things to think about. So pray for her. Two weeks from tonight, we'll be having our gospel meeting going on. And, and Freddie's not going to speak from here. He's going to speak from there. Because I'm optimistic that he's not going to have to preach over 18 empty pews. So y'all help me out there. Again, if you'd like to have Freddie and Inga provide a meal for them, you might want to say we can have a meal Tuesday night, meet here at the building at 5 o'clock, have the meal, and then have worship at 7. Maybe you'd like to do something like that Tuesday or Wednesday. Let Rachel know if you'd like to do something like that. Speaking from experience, before I preach, I don't want to have a heavy meal because it makes me groggy, and you don't want me to be groggy when I preach. So that's in two weeks. Remember that. James chapter 4. Open your copy of God's Word to James chapter 4, and we're going to feed our spirits just on these 17 verses tonight. There is an Indian tribe that I read about that has this ritual that they go through when the boys turn 13. They take them out into the woods at night, and they leave them there when it's dark. They can imagine this 13-year-old boy out there in the woods. Not much moonlight. That defeats the purpose. He hears a wolf howling in the distance. Twigs snapping. He wonders what that means. Eventually, the night is engulfed by sunlight. And the next morning as the light filters through the trees, he starts seeing things around him. The trees, the flowers, the outline of the path. And he sees a man standing there with a bow and arrow in his hand. It's his dad. And he's been there all night long. God is present in our lives. All the time. And God is willing and able to give us what we need. If we'll let him. 
But human beings have a difficult time being jealous of other people. And we're not necessarily jealous of possessions, somebody's car or their house. We can be jealous of somebody else's relationship with their spouse. We can be jealous of somebody else's relationship with their kids. We might even be jealous of somebody else's relationship with God. So jealousy can take lots of different forms. Jealousy is very old. The Philistines were envious of Isaac in Genesis chapter 26. Joseph's brothers were envious that God revealed visions to him and not to them. And so they sold him into slavery. It's easy for a Christian to judge wealthy people. It's easy for us to look down at the spirituality of a Christian who lives a lifestyle that we can't live and to question their spirituality. Rachel and I have a friend whose son is around our age. Last year, he bought a Lamborghini. What's your initial reaction to that? Is your initial reaction, he must be worldly minded? In fact, he had a Porsche. And his wife said, you can't buy a Lamborghini until you get rid of the Porsche. He sold the Porsche and bought the Lamborghini in the same day. What about what he gives to the church? What about his involvement in the church? What about his contribution? Does that factor into our judgment of him and his spirituality? He is a Christian. And as far as I know, he's active in the congregation where he worships. In fact, the last time we talked to him, he worshipped at the congregation where David Shannon used to preach. If you remember, David Shannon speaking to us last year. He's the president of Freed Hardeman now. On the other end of the spectrum, it's easy for wealthy Christians to judge poor Christians. It was especially easy for people in James's day to do that. Because the mentality was, God blesses faithfulness. And so if you're not blessed, and it's easy for us to judge blessings in terms of material possessions, if you're not blessed, it's because God's not blessing you. It's because you're not faithful like you should be. Maybe you're lazy. Maybe you're suffering from the results of bad decisions you've made. But maybe you're not as faithful to God as you should be because you're poor. There was a time when we were living in Romania and I was traveling in a taxi with one of our Christian men. And we were driving through an area where some new subdivisions were being built. Now subdivisions are new in Romania. Or at least they were when we were living there. They, they had subdivisions back before communism and the dictator wiped them out, moved everybody into high-rise apartment buildings. So they're getting back to that idea of subdivisions. We were driving through one of the newer subdivisions, and there were houses there that by Romanian standards were big, about 1,500 square feet. And my Romanian brother made some comment about the pretentiousness of people who would need a house so large. What was he doing? He was judging people's spirituality based on external measurements. I pointed out to him that a lot of times people need bigger houses because they have bigger families. I said, in fact, 1,500 square feet is a small house in the United States. In James's day, he writes to Christians, to churches of Christ that sprouted up among the Jewish synagogues scattered throughout the Mediterranean world. 
And it seems to me that a big part of the problem that the Christians were experiencing, because this theme runs through all five chapters of James, is problems between wealthy Christians and poor Christians. It begins, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, where James writes about a brother in humble circumstances. James uses the word poor five times in his five chapters. The rich, he uses that word just in chapter 2. But as we see tonight in chapter 4, and if we went on into chapter 5, we would see that that theme runs on into the last chapter of the letter. So James is trying to help Christians have unity by judging based on Jesus' standards, not our standards. And based on that principle, I think, even if we don't have problem with jealousy relative to Christians who are wealthier or poorer than we are, the point that we don't judge others based on our own standards is still relevant for us. So let's feed our spirits on these 17 chapters, 17 verses. I've divided it up into five paragraphs, and the main point to me is the main thought in that paragraph. So the first paragraph, verses 1 through 5, you don't have because you don't ask. Look at what, Paul, what James writes. I don't know how many times I might say Paul tonight. Look how many times James, uh, or, or, or how James begins this discussion. What is the cause of your quarrels and conflicts among you? Is the cause not your pleasures that are waging war in your members? The members there, I believe, refers to the members of the church. They were having conflicts and quarrels. Now, I don't know exactly what the conflicts and quarrels were about. When Paul writes 1 Corinthians and they're having conflicts and quarrels, Paul tells them in chapter 3, it's because you're, you're fleshly minded and you're acting immature. James says, it's not the source of your conflicts and quarrels, your pleasures. The word pleasure here in the Greek language is hedone, which gives us our English word hedonism. Self-indulgent pleasures. We all have our pleasures. There are things you like to do. Some of you like to go out to the beach. Some of you like to go out on the boat. Some of you like kayaking and, and canoeing. Rachel and I prefer the mountains. We prefer hiking. We prefer to be in the woods. We all have our pleasures. Pleasures don't necessarily have to be sinful. But whatever it was causing the problems among these Christians, it was serious. Look at how James words these things. He talks about conflicts. He talks about quarrels. Notice in verse 2, James says that you lust and you do not have and so you commit murder. You are envious and you cannot obtain and so you fight and quarrel. Look at the intensity of those words that James is using. Quarrels and conflicts and war and lust and envy and fighting. Now I don't think that they were doing those things literally. But James is using very strong words to show that this conflict that they were having was intense. And James tells them there in verse 2. You don't have because you don't ask. We don't need to lust after what somebody else has. We don't need to be envious of what somebody else has. If there's something that we feel like we need that would improve our lives, James would say, ask God. Don't be lusting over what somebody else has. Ask God. There are a number of times where Jesus tells us, and there's two verses on the screen, He tells us that if we want something, we ask Him and He will give it to us. 
So James says, if you want something, ask God for it. God provides us jobs so that we can have to provide for our needs. And, if you were to read Ephesians 4 and verse 28, to give to those who are in need. So notice what James says in verse 3. You ask, but do not receive, because you ask with impure motives, so that you can spend it on your own pleasures. What is the motivation for our prayers? What is the heart of our desires? Is it self-serve? How much do we spend on ourselves? Notice the strong language that James uses in verse 4. You adulteresses. I believe the old King James Version uses adulterers and adulteresses. Stronger manuscripts just have the feminine form. That goes back to the days of the prophets. Where Israel is pictured as being the wife of God. And when Israel gave her heart to idols, then she was being unfaithful to God. Therefore, she was committing adultery, spiritual adultery against God. Hosea, the minor prophet, especially focuses on that concept. Here, James says, Christians might be committing spiritually adult spiritual adultery against God because our hearts are about lusting and envying after what somebody else has. Jesus called His generation an adulterous generation in Matthew 12 and verse 39. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever would be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, James is not talking about driving a Lamborghini. James is talking about lusting and envying after what somebody else has. That's what he's criticizing. He says, if you're a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do we somehow think that we're spiritually superior to other people because... They live a different lifestyle than we do. James is going to call us in verses 11 and 12 to be careful how we judge. So we'll get to that in just a moment. Verse 5. James says, or do the scriptures speak to no purpose when they say he jealously desires the spirit which he made to dwell in you? There are a number of questions about that verse. First of all, what scripture that he's had, does he have in mind? There's no single scripture that says that. So scholars suggest that James is just summarizing what the Old Testament says. Question number two. Who was the one who jealously desires? Question number three. The spirit in the text. Is that the Holy Spirit or is it man's spirit? Without going into the details of the argument, I propose to you that James is saying God jealously desires us to give our spirits to Him. The Old Testament teaches several times, Ten Commandments, for example, to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, that God is a jealous God. God wants our hearts in their entirety. And so James in that verse is using the word that he applies to, to Christians in verse 2, the word jealous, and he applies it to God and says, you are jealous of other people's things. God is jealous for you. And he wants you to give your spirit to him. Don't give your spirit to the things of the world, the pursuit of the world. Lusting and envying. Give your spirit to God. To word it another way, we envy others. God envies us. And He wants us to give our hearts to Him. For So the first point there in the first five verses is 
You don't have because you don't ask. Second point, verses 6 through 10, is that subject about humility. God gives a greater grace. Greater than what? Greater than what we can desire. Greater than what we lust after. Greater than what we envy. If we will be patient on God and let God give us what He knows we need at the right time, then the grace that God gives us is going to be greater than what our own hearts pursue after. But that requires humility. It requires humility to wait on God. It requires humility to be patient with God. It requires humility on our part to be content with what God gives us. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. We know what verse that is. That's Proverbs 3 and verse 34. Pride and proud. Used a hundred times in the New American Standard Version. Humble and humility are used 99 times. God demands us to be humble. God opposes pride. It's one of the most condemned sins in Scripture. And it might not be, but what the most often committed. And so James says, submit therefore to God. Submit to God. Let Him satisfy your needs at the right time and in the right way. Don't lust and envy other people. So resist the devil. In the context, I believe this resisting the devil has to do with lusting and envying what other people have. Lusting and envying what other people have. Resist the devil. The principle, of course, applies in all of the areas of life relative to all sins. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. At least for a period of time, he did that with Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. We have those urges to, to desire what somebody else has. James says, squelch the urges. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. But now this humility towards God has got to, to, to be visible in our lives. James, of course, was a Jew. And there's lots of Jewish thinking going on in his mind. He says, cleanse your hands, sinners. That's likely a reference to the laver that was in front of the tabernacle that the priest had to wash their hands and their feet before they entered into the tabernacle. So James says, make sure your behavior is pure in the eyes of God. But it has to touch more than just the outside. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's the inside. That's the attitude. You see, we can't jealously desire God and be lustful and envious of things of this world at the same time. That word translated double-minded literally means double soul. We can't give our essence to God and our essence to desires at the same time. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom, James says. You need to have a repentance that affects your mind and your heart. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. So in the context, quarreling and conflicts and fighting, James says you don't have because you don't ask. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and He will exalt you. 
But now we go on to this next paragraph and James criticizes the Christians for using the wrong standard in judging. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges the brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer. You are no longer a doer of the law, but they judge of it. But there's only one lawgiver and one judge. The one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you? Who judge? Your neighbor. Family, it is so easy for us to use our own standard of spirituality in judging each other. And James says, no, no, no. If a brother is wealthier than we are, we judge him. His heart surely is not right with God. Look at how he spends his money. If somebody is poorer than we are, we judge them. We say they, they're not wise, they're not smart like I am. They're lazy. They're, they're suffering from their poor choices. Notice that James says in verse 12, at the end of verse 11, he says, if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. And so if we take our standard of spirituality and re-raise it to the level of God's standard of spirituality, we don't become a servant of the Word anymore. We become the judge of the Word. In essence, we're saying, God, you should have used my standard of spirituality when you wrote your Bible. And we can't do that. We cannot do that. James points out there in verse 12, there's only one lawgiver. And one judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. So the essence of this two-verse paragraph here is that we don't need to judge our neighbor. Not based on our standards. Simply based on what the Word of God says. Jesus is the one who makes the rules. And so we move into this last paragraph where James points out to the Christians there that we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Why are we lusting when we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow? Why are we envious when we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow? Why are we discontented with what God has given to us today when we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow? Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we're going to go into such and such city, we're going to spend a year, and we're going to engage in business, and we're going to make a profit. Doesn't that describe the American attitude? I'm, a gonna, I'm going to do tomorrow the same thing I did today. This is how much money I'm going to make over the next 6 months, 12 months, 10 years, whatever. This is how I'm going to spend it. Don't we do that? Now to a certain extent we do need to do that because we need to make plans. We need to have a, rain, a rainy day fund, all of that. But James's point is, don't leave God out of your plans. He goes on to say that life is just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And before we know it, we're going to be looking God in the eyes and answering for where our heart was while we were on earth. There are some Jews who came to Jesus in Luke chapter 12 and wanted Him to settle a dispute about their estate. And in that context, in verse 15, Jesus reminds human beings that life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. You can't judge your own spirituality based on your bank account. And you certainly can't judge somebody else's spirituality based on their bank account. The standard of judgment is the Word of God. And so in verse 15, James says, here's what you need to do. Rather. You need to say, if the Lord 
wills. We will live and do this or that. Solomon reminded the Jewish audience in Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 1, Do not boast yourself of tomorrow, because you do not know what a day will bring forth. Same sentiments as James here in this text. We need to live from day to day with the mentality, If the Lord wills. Going back to that verse in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14, where James promises us that if we ask anything, he will give it to us. There's that caveat. If the Lord wills. And that takes humility. It takes patience to wait on God to give us what he knows we need at the right time and to the right degree. And we don't need to be prideful. Notice what James warns in verse 16. He says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. You boast in your pride. And such boasting is evil. It's evil in the eyes of God. These are Christians who were lusting and envying after what each other had, so much so that it was creating some type of war going on in the church. And James's message is, you've got to stop it. So in verse 17, he gives his conclusion. Notice 17 begins with the word, therefore. It's one of three general definitions of sin in the New Testament. First one's Romans 14 and verse 23. If you do anything without faith, it's sinful. This is the second one. The third one is 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Sin is lawlessness. So here James says, Therefore to him who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him he's committed sin. So you don't have because you don't ask and so you lust and envy after other people. You need to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will exalt you. Who are you to judge your neighbor? Life is just a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. If you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, it's sin. So family, there's James's message to us today. I said five at the beginning of the lessons, just four, right? One, two, three, four, yeah, four. How does that apply to you where you are? You don't have because you don't ask. You need to humble your heart in the sight of the Lord. Humility is easy to do when people tell me what, what, what I want to hear. The hard part comes when people tell me what I need to do and I don't want to do it. Humility doesn't come easily. It means we have to break our hearts and say, yes, that's the right thing to do. And I'll do it. To do the other is sinful. Don't judge your neighbor. The only judge is Jesus Christ, and He's given us in His Word what we need to judge by, and that's what we need to use as our standard of judgment. Not these externals, not these superficial things. Leave those alone. Don't judge your neighbor. Don't speak against a brother. Can we help you tonight in your walk with Jesus Christ? In whatever way we might help, let us know. Let's stand and sing together.
I don't remember ever saying this as a preacher. But I grew up believing that Christians did not get tattoos. I went through a good bit of my early life thinking that if a Christian got a tattoo, they were just probably just thinking in worldly terms. I moved back to the United States after living in Romania for seven and a half years. There was a woman in the church there who was as faithful as she could be based on God's standards. And one time I saw she 